So when, only when they have handouts. Like they say, hey, man, hand it back to you. Doing? <clears throat> and they do. They're like, like not eat. here, pass this out. Are you getting your vitamin C? <laughs> Unless you do. There's such a thing. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> you, you don't appear to be doing anything. Like, pass this back. Yeah, we're trying to get you a different. <clears throat> yeah, it worked out. Look. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gibson, I'm going to wait for you. Exactly. How are you? Congratulations. I put your signs on your porch. I saw that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A minute to spare. <laughs> One of the problems here. Are you, you planning on missing a few? <laughs> 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 Just one in the first all these years. Actually, if you do have a death of a, mm -hmm. of a family member and miss a meeting, that one on one. Excuse yeah. me, not affect. They don't count as they don't count as abuse. <laughs> Unless it's your own death, well, then you will yeah, be kicked I, off yeah. the count. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they prove you responsible for the <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. Uh, the members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue that's before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item this evening, please go to the table over to my left and sign up to speak. For those of you who do wish to speak, when you come up to the microphone, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. And make sure you speak clearly into the microphone. Uh, if you have any audio or, or visuals that you want to put up, let us know as well and we can help you put those up. Uh, each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking against, in opposition, we'll have 10 minutes to present for each side, and the time will be divided among all the persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you very much. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Alturk. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Johnson has requested an excused absence. Commissioner Ghosh? Present. Commissioner Bryan? Present. Commissioner Satterfield? Present. Commissioner Harris? Present. Commissioner Busby? Present. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Uh, Commissioner Miller? Present. Commissioner Kinchin? <laughs> Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. Commissioner Van? Present. Commissioner Gibbs? Commissioner Freeman? Present. Great, thank you very much. We will move on to the approval of the minutes and the consistency mm -hmm. statement from our October 10th, 2017 meeting. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe I had the pleasure of meeting our clerk, Terry Elliott, at our October meeting. And so I think her name need to, needs to be added to the list of staff present. Great. So noted, Commissioner Bryan, thank you. Any other additions or edits to the minutes of the consistency statement? I move approval as amended. Second. Great, properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your right hand.
None opposed. Motion, Motion carries. Uh, Steph. Good evening, Grace Smith with the Planning Department. Um, I'm not aware of any adjustments to the agenda this evening. I would remind the um, chair and the commission that at the end of the meeting, we need to approve the 2018 meeting schedule and your um, what's coming next month will be emailed to you tomorrow. We have several cases on the uh, agenda and I need to make sure I have them correct before I send you the list. Okay. So, thank you. That sounds good, thanks Ms. Smith. Oh, let me add for the record that all um, public hearings have been advertised in compliance with the state and local um, laws and affidavits for such are on file in the planning department. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Accept a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Great, that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, we will move on to our public hearings. Our first public hearing is a comprehensive plan future land use map amendment with the concurrent zoning map changes. Again, if anyone wishes to sign up to speak, please go sign up on the table on my left and uh, you, we will call you up to speak. Uh, the first case is A1700005 and Z1700012 for the Durham Rescue Mission, and we'll start with the staff report. Good evening. Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. You have to excuse me, I'm nursing a cold here. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> this is for case A17005. <clears throat> Z170012, the Durham Rescue Mission. The applicant is Wendy Ramsen with Coulter Jewel Thames. The property is located within the city's jurisdiction. The applicant is requesting a FLOM request change from medium density residential <coughs> commercial from medium high density residential. The zone request is from several different zoning districts on one site, residential suburban multifamily, residential urban multifamily, commercial center, commercial neighborhood with a planned uh, development plan, two residential urban multifamily with a development plan, RUMD. The property is 5.65 acres, and the applicant is proposing up to 78 one and two bedroom apartments with up to 140 surface and garage parking spaces. <clears throat> this is the aerial map, which shows the property highlighted in red. It is located within the urban development tier and within the Cape Fear River Basin. Residential and commercial uses are uh, found predominantly surrounding the site. <clears throat> An apartment building is located directly to the west. A garden apartment is located to the northeast. Single family and two family homes are located to the north, west, and south. And uh, commercial developments um, and retail uses are found to the east. This is the existing conditions map. The site is irregular in size and it fronts primarily on House Road as well as Lafayette Street and Shelton Street. The property is vacant with small areas of pavement encroaching into the development parcel from adjacent parcels located in the northwestern and northeastern property boundaries. There is also a sanitary sewer easement that runs through the property in a diagonal nature. An additional sanitary easement located along Shopper Street, which is a private road. <clears throat> there is also an off-site intermittent stream and portions of, 50, of a 50 foot buffer and a 10 foot no build area that extends onto the property. And there are uh, portions of the site that contain steep slopes as well. The property is currently designated medium density residential, which is six to 12 units per acre and commercial under the future land use map. 
and the applicant, which is shown on the left, and the applicant is proposing to change the site to high, medium high density, which is eight to 20 units per acre, which would there be consistent with the rezoning request. The rezoning request, as I mentioned, the applicant is proposing to change the current zoning, which is shown in various multicolors there. Um, you've got the, um, the RUM, the RSM, uh, the CC and the CN zones all currently on the site. And what the applicant is proposing to do is to put it in the RUM uh, district, the residential urban multifamily district with a development plan. The staff has reviewed the re request and found it be to be consistent with the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance. The project meets, the project and the property meet the RUM, the RUM district requirements in terms of density, maximum building height, the development plan, excuse me, the development plan shows the open space requirements, the maximum pervious coverage, and the tree coverage areas are all being met. And this slide provides just a short uh, summary of, um, of what the applicant is proposing and, and, and how it's consistent with the Unified Development Code. This is the um, proposed conditions or the proposed development map. And in addition to providing some of those details that I described before, you also see various access points, project boundary buffers, tree preservation areas, the riparian areas, the various easements shown throughout the property, um, the areas where there are encroachments are also shown in easements. And the next slide provides a short summary of the commitments in terms of what the applicant has provided on the plan. There will be separate pedestrian access points throughout the projects. All of the encroachment areas um, will be shown in easements. There is a um, water line extension in Merrimack Street as per city standards. Um, the, there will be a, a minimum of eight bicycle parking spaces that will be covered, um, and there are other various graphic and design commitments shown on the plan. In terms of being consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and policies, uh, staff found that it was not consistent with the medium density residential future land use map, and they're seeking an amendment of that to medium high density. In terms of the zoning map change, the application is consistent with policy 2.13D. It is also contiguous with other residential development and compatible with surrounding uses. And in terms of an analysis of um, infrastructure, we have found it to be uh, compatible and consistent with that, that sufficient infrastructure exists. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. I'll be happy to any, answer any questions that you have. Hey, thank you very much. Well, I'll note before we open the public hearing, uh, Commissioners Kenshin and uh, Gibbs have joined us. And at this point, we will open the, the public hearing. And if I could get the, the sign up, thank you. <coughs> Great, thank you. So we have one speaker signed up for the proposal, and it's Dan Jewell. You have 10 full minutes at your disposal. If I use those, I'm in trouble. So thank you, Brian, and good evening, uh, commissioners. I am Dan Jewell, president of Culture Jewel Thames. Um, our uh, clients, Broadmoor, Lakewood, have asked us to assist them with this uh, proposal tonight, the rezoning and the land planning effort that goes with it. Uh, with me here this evening is our project manager in our office, landscape architect, Wendy Ramsden, and our local development team, Ken, Steve, Matt, 
and William are all here as well, uh, interested in the outcome and also happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we'd like to set the record straight. I think we already got a clarification in the staff report, but this is not Durham Rescue Mission. They owned the property at the time that we submitted the application, but since then our client has purchased it from them. So Rescue Mission has no involvement whatsoever in this project. Um, this parcel was part of the original Lakewood Shopping Center and still is, uh, other than the ownership now. If you look at uh, Gary Kieber's excellent Open Durham website, you will see photographs of this property being graded and cleared along with the rest of the shopping center. And uh, it was left cleared and flat, uh, might have had some gravel on it at one time. We can only assume that at one point they assumed they were going to put some parking or maybe an out parcel on it, but, uh, but they didn't. And it sat vacant for 55 years until today. Um, it, so it's been nothing. It's, it's got weeds and things like that on it. What, what the property is now is, is a mess. Uh, it's a mess from two standpoints. It's a mess from a physical standpoint, as it is overgrown with weeds and brush, if, if you visited the site out there. Uh, there's trash strewn about the site, blowing off from adjacent properties. And there are the numerous urban campers, as I call them, who uh, occasionally will pitch tents out there and hang, hang, hang out on the site. Um, and it also seems to be a popular dumping ground for uh, shopping carts for the, from the food line. People will drop them off here on their way to and from the other uh, places that they live. But most importantly, as Jamie <coughs> said, it's also a mess from a zoning and future land use map standpoint. Uh, there are currently two land use designations, commercial, medium density, residential, and four, yes, four, <coughs> zoning designations on the site. So absent a rezoning, the hodgepodge of rezoning districts would make it very challenging, if not impossible, to do anything on the site but leave it alone as each zoning boundary actually requires a landscape buffer. So it would all be chopped up with that. We think that this has become much too important a site to leave alone. Many of you know that this neighborhood is becoming the next Durham do-it-yourself district. Uh, the properties around the shopping center are get, getting revitalized with commercial investments, uh, restaurants, and we have the very exciting proposal by the Scrap Exchange to create the reuse arts district in the north end of the shopping center and of course they occupied the old uh, Lakewood Theater many, many years ago and that is now their, their home. So with restaurants, offices, other businesses, a grocery store, churches, and other services, all within close proximity to this property, uh, we think a modestly scaled multifamily development would be a very appropriate addition to the mix of other things that are going on. If any of you are familiar with the walk score website, bike score website, where you can actually go in and plug in your address and it, it tells you what the walkability of that is, uh, this has been increasing in walkability and we think it will be much more high walkability when all of these other services are, are completed and added. So what we'd like to propose is a new multifamily community on the site uh, and the zoning and flume request we have before you will allow this to happen. These will not be luxury apartments. This will not be one of those large two to 300 unit complexes that you're seeing being built up and down the 147 and West Main Street corridor. Rather, and what we represented to the neighbors at the neighborhood meeting, is that this will be in the spirit of the neighborhood, be modestly scaled to provide a reasonable transition from the existing multifamily and single family to the north and west to the existing commercial to the south and east. Remember, the bulk of the property is currently zoned commercial, some sort of commercial. So even though the RUM zoning that we are requesting would allow up to 20 units to the acre, or roughly 112 units, we are committing to only about two thirds of that density, or 70 <coughs> units. We think that's all the property can comfortably support given some of the uh, physical challenges of it. 
As I said, we held a neighborhood meeting at the Scrap Exchange back in February where eight neighbors attended. The main discussion points they brought up were traffic impacts, of course, uh, cleaning up the trash and undergrowth on the property, and coordination with redevelopment and the shopping center. So relative to traffic, if you reviewed the staff report, you'll show that the projected traffic impact from the new zoning is about a fifth of what it is under the current zoning designation. Also keep in mind, if you've been out there, there are multiple ways to get out of here, quickly up to Moorhead, just a short block, a couple ways over to Chapel Hill Road, down to the shopping center, so there's good connectivity. Uh, staff report also shows that Chapel Hill Road is currently under capacity on the average daily trips. And also, to make it a tad easier, and again, to promote the idea of walkability and bikeability, um, we are committing to at least eight of those bike spaces that Jamie uh, showed, showed uh, minimum being covered so that folks will maybe think first about getting on, on their bike rather than jumping in their car with all the services close by. We'll certainly be cleaning up the site. Uh, keep in mind there were no stormwater controls today. We will be installing all those that are currently required by the, the city. Uh, and yes, we have been communicating with the neighbors and the redevelopment of the shopping center. Our firm is actually now working with the Scrap Exchange on the next iteration of their due diligence and master planning, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we actually worked with the group up at the entrance to the shopping center that's building the, uh, the county fair permanent food truck rodeo, as I call it. Um, and I have some long history with this property. Um, I worked on probably the last facelift that was done on the Lakewood Shopping Center in 1988. And I dare say, I, was, I would suspect those owners haven't spent a dime on it since then. So it is, it is time for, uh, and they don't own it anymore. They sold it off in, in pieces. Um, so in closing, we hope you can agree that this is a reasonable proposal for this neighborhood, that it creates an appropriate transition between the existing residential and the existing commercial that surrounds it. It's a more appropriate use than the commercial that takes up the bulk of the property zoning at the moment, and most appropriately, that is a very appropriate location for a little more residential density in order to add to the mix of the vibrant, walkable, bikeable place that the old Lakewood Shopping Center District is becoming. The team and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we would hope you could find it in yourselves to make a positive recommendation to council. And as a postscript, um, most of you know me. Uh, you're noticing my mouth is a bit asymmetrical right now. It wasn't a stroke. I have something called Bell's palsy, which I've been told will go away in time. Treatment helps. So I'm doubling down with acupuncture and good old traditional Western drugs. So uh, wish me well. Hopefully that will work fast. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. We always wish you well. Uh, anyone else who would like to speak? No one else has signed up, but the public hearing is still open if anyone would like to speak on this issue. Seeing none, we will move to close the public hearing, and I'd like to open up for discussion of the commissioners. Any commissioners who would like to speak on this issue? Great. We will start with Commissioner Miller, and we'll move from there. Dan, I have questions for you. So this is a very peculiar site. And I am troubled by the idea that you might actually have an access off of Lafayette Street, because that's a 25-foot straight drop down. Yes. Uh, evidently, when Rand uh, graded the site out there, he just cut a hill in two. Um, how are you going to cope with that? So we're troubled by that as well. In fact, there's one point where it's a 40-foot drop. Yeah, I've actually measured that. That's in your tree safe area. Yeah, that's in our tree safe area. That's right. Where you have another connection, but I understand why you want to get out of that. Yeah, yeah. So this is very similar to the Village Hearth case we brought to you earlier this year, where the staff, the UDO, requires us to show that access as part of the rezoning. But we also learned on that case that we've got that cryptic little note on our development plan that allows us, at the time of site plan approval, to ask for it to go away because there are compelling reasons such as the other development, topographical issues, physical constraints, and in fact, that's what we will do. So as a realistic 
matter, you're really talking about the Merrimack Avenue accident. Yes, sir. Um, and because of this easement that's in here for utilities, I'm having a hard time understanding where the building's going to go and how the parking's going to be organized. Right, right. How might that work on this property? <coughs> oh, it, the, 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 the development will not happen in the tiny little uh, neck that goes down below the, uh, the, the northernmost shopping center building. That's just- the, Where it's currently paved. Yeah, where it's, where it's currently paved. So there, there's, there's really not room in there to do anything other than maybe some amenities or open space or something of that nature. So so the bulk of the development will happen in the, the fat part of the site. Structured parking? Uh, no, it won't be. It won't be structured parking. No, a, a project like this wouldn't be able to afford to do that. But uh, we will have to stay out of those. Uh, th th there may have to be a realignment of those utilities before it's all said and done. We understand that could become part of the project. Are you concerned about that slope that that would be your, I guess, your western boundary? I'm not sure. Thing oriented right, but uh, we're only concerned from a standpoint is we're going to have to take ownership and figure out how to stabilize it and maintain it. So that that is what gives us concern. We will not be developing that slope. And so, how tall will your buildings be to get all seventy eight units? The, 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 we are not into the building design yet at all. Jamie said that the ordinance allows fifty five feet. Um, we didn't want to commit to anything less just yet because we haven't designed it. But um, we'll we'll see. I have a question for the staff if I can follow up. You may. So with a commitment of 78 units uh, in the development plan, uh, if they discover they need fewer units, are they going to be trapped in any way? Or is this a ma an upwards limit? <clears throat> Jamie Sonyak, uh, Planning Department. As long as they are consistent with what the future land use designation allows for in terms of density, they should be fine. And so there's a, a cap at the, um, it's eight to 20, I believe. So the, uh, they're asking for eight, so as long as they don't drop below eight units an acre, right. they're, and they're asking for 15. Correct, they're currently just around 15. They're committing to no more than 15 is the better way to put it. Okay, so the only thing I can say is, I. I'm trying to get my head around how that's going to happen back there and whether it's a good thing. I'm not sure I'm convinced. Uh, it's a difficult piece of property. It has lots of limitations. Uh, that seems like too many units to me. I'm happier with the current future land use designation and wonder whether or not the property could be developed within that. Which one? There's two future land use designations on the property. Well, a future, uh, the residential future land use. I would rather see it go to that uh, rather than to create this pot of, of, of medium high. Noted. Yeah, noted. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Satterfield. Uh, yes, also a question for you, sir. Uh, yes. As a matter of interest, considering the changing demographic of that neighborhood, as you pointed out, I was just wondering what the um, price point for the apartments is going to be, considering I read in here that the target audience or the target market is workforce housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know yet. There's a there's a definition of workforce housing that we, we pulled down, and we told the neighbors that this is what we would be, be doing. Uh, it says... Workforce housing, teachers, firefighters, police officers, municipal employees, healthcare workers, other essential service workers need safe housing options within a reasonable distance to their work. So uh, I can't tell you what that price point is yet, but we told the neighbors that that's what we're going to be working on, and that's what we will tell the council as well. And I'm sure the council will have some questions about what exactly that means, so um, we have a little more, more homework to do on that. So, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question. Um, let me preface it with a comment. First of all, I, I agree with the basic premise. I think this would be a nice development if you can get it done, because I have concerns about the topography as well. But I also have a concern about the entrance to Lafayette Street. I understand it. it's difficult looking at it with all the differences in depths and so forth. I just wanted to make a note that the shortest distance from the nearest fire department to this property comes down Justice Street to Lafayette. Interesting. I didn't know that. And if 
Now, there are three ways they could get there. They could go down Chapel Hill and come down House. That's twice as far. Mm -hmm. Or they could split the difference and go through the shopping center. But the most direct way to the property is down Justice to Lafayette. So I would ask you to keep that in mind as you're, you know, planning it further. We, we will definitely look at that. I mean, more points of entry are, are obviously... Uh, but but what we did talk to neighbors about, they 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 um, they reminded us, and we know that there's some pedestrian connectivity through the site, mm -hmm. both to the uh, lower income apartments to the uh, to the west, and uh, and Jamie mentioned where actually they have an encroachment that we're going to respect, so they don't have to sp spend money redoing that, and and possibly one or both of those uh, road connections that we've shown could become pedestrian connections instead of road connections. Again, it's all in the spirit of walkability. So, good comment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. And thanks, Dan, for the presentation and wish you a smooth recovery. Um, Thank you. I, you know, I agree with you that this is a, uh, a reasonable request, and, but I, there are a couple of things that, that have given me pause, and I want to follow up on Commissioner Satterfield's um, comment or question to you about workforce housing. I, um, Seems to me like that's a very vague term, and I, you know, there are lots of different answers to what that is. But um, I, I, you know, the other thing you said in your presentation is that this is the next up-and-coming do-it-yourself right neighborhood. You, I think you called it, and we know that that means that housing is no matter how modest you make the, the uh, I guess development, it's going to be pretty expensive, right? And I, so I'm. I guess I'm a little worried that it's not going to end up being workforce housing. And aside, you know, from actually requiring or uh, committing, I guess, to some affordable housing uh, units, I'm wondering what you could do to make sure that it, they, those units are affordable for the long run. Right, right, right. Well, uh, a couple of things we're doing are making sure these are, they're not, you know, big grandiose three-bedroom units and big apartments. They're going to be more modestly scaled, smaller, and I know that's hard to quantify right now and put in as a proffer. That's, that's what we told the, uh, told the neighbors. But um, I think as much as anything, all I can say is just like any residential case that we brought before this group in the last two, three years, um, the, the, the council will likely have some expectations on what that is. Um, Having gone through those, every council person has a different idea of what that expectation is. So if you would uh, let us work with the council and figure out what's going to make them comfortable in terms of, uh, you know, some sort of long-term workforce housing uh, design or whatever that element might be, then, um, then that's what we'd, we'd like to do. I, I can't stand up here tonight and say that X number of the units are going to be at 80% AMI or 60% AMI or even 100% AMI, which, believe it or not, in Chapel Hill and Carborough is becoming more, one of the more affordable uh, uh, benchmarks. But uh, what, I, what I will say is we know the council will have expectations, and we're going to work with them. Okay. I, I guess I'm on the fence on this because I, I, I um, guess we could kick it down the road, but I... Um, or whatever expression to use, but um, uh, I guess if you can't commit to something now, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about it. So, okay. Yeah, okay. I just Thank wanted you. to let you know before I vote. Yeah. We, yeah. we won't get to council until January or February, and uh, every one of the new council members ran on affordable housing. So right. we're very aware of that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Ghosh, and sorry I skipped you earlier. Actually, I don't think I raised my hand the first time, but welcome. I had a couple comments, not necessarily questions. Um, I don't know if, if all of you have had a chance to go out to the site, but if you haven't, um, the site is a mess. Uh, it doesn't look like a very easy site to develop, and I think everyone can recognize that uh, in its location, it is an important site that probably ought to be developed. If you look at the zoning map, the zoning on the site makes no sense, and so I hope we could all agree that it, it does need to be rezoned. And if we can, then I think the question is, uh, whether this is an appropriate use for this um, for this parcel. And, uh, you know, the way I look at it is I think residential makes sense in this area, particularly multifamily. Uh, it does act in, in some ways as a transition. Uh, the With the future land use map designation that's being requested, I mean, this is in our urban tier. I'm fully in support of it. We have to start getting more dense if we're going to have any kind of affordability in Durham. 
Uh, you know, so I, I, if we're in the urban tier, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be medium high density residential. I uh, will also note that they're not even at the top end of that, um, that range of, of uh, dwelling units per acre that's allowed in there. They're closer to 15, uh, and that's because of the steep slopes. If it was a flat site, they'd be more like 13. Um, as far as affordability, I think there are some, you know, just to, to note, there are some aspects on the development plan that I think speak to uh, affordability by design. I think it's, you know, everyone would be more comfortable if there was some sort of proper, but these notations at the uh, different difficult um, connection points that, that uh, through this UDO section, they may try to um, not do those connections. If they were required to do those connections, they would automatically make the site more expensive to develop, and therefore it would make the, the units more expensive to rent. You know, so things like that, I think, are, are, are important to note. I mean, this is a difficult site, no matter the, which way it's developed. Um, and, you know, I think it has potential, for example, as a commercial site, but I don't know that it makes it good sense for it to become commercial. So in, in, in that regard, I think I'm generally in support of this. They haven't maxed out the density, which I think is uh, respect, respectable. And, you know, oftentimes we see developers try to cram as many units as they can on a site. I don't think that's what's going on here. Um, I think they have, you know, done whatever feasibility study and, and they have come up with 78 units, which just happens to be over the uh, medium density residential. And I think that's probably the only reason they're looking for the FLUM designation. Uh, what the FLUM map looks like visually, you know, what, when you create a pocket of high density residential or whatever in the middle of uh, commercial and, and medium density residential, that's optics. It doesn't really mean anything. At the end of the day, this development plan would limit the number of units to a maximum of 78, one and two bedroom apartments. I mean, I, I don't know what, we might as well just, you know, not have the, uh, the, the, the notation that the medium high density residential flum designation gives you up to 20 units per acre. That's not what they're asking for. Um, I'm going to support this. I think it's important for uh, the city of Durham and in, in particular this area. Um, I hope that it will become workforce housing. I know that term is not defined in any reasonable way, but with the council that we have just elected, I imagine that we will start to see a lot of a movement on affordability issues, whether it be a percentage of AMI or you know this this idea of workforce housing, and so I'm confident that uh, the the city council will be able to uh, the new city council will be able to uh, you know address some of the concerns that people are raising, and I hope that you all can find a, a reason to support this one because I think this is an important case for Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hyman. Yes, uh, my question is for Mr. Jewell, if you could. Um... I'm always pleased to hear that there have been interactions with the community and the individuals seem to have given you quite a bit of, of feedback. Um, you indicated that eight people attended, you know, one of the community meetings. I'm curious about how many more could have, the, you know, attended. Um, and, and the fact that they're not here indicates to me that they were pretty satisfied um, am I reading that correctly since, you know, none of them are here to object to the project? So I, I, I think our notification list, good question, was uh, several hundred people. Okay. Uh, now, um, keep in mind that a good part of the capture zone was Maplewood Cemetery. Those people did not come to the neighborhood <laughs> meeting. Uh, but there, there's, okay. there's, a, there's already a good mix of, uh, there's a lot of apartments in, in this, in right. this uh, part of town. So uh, we, we do think that only eight people showed up uh, was, a, was just a sign that those are the folks who are interested in what's going on in their, in their community. And it's like I said, nobody said, go away, it's bad. They said, here's what we'd like you to take care of and address. And that's what we tried to do. So thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Commissioner Freeman. Uh, thank you. I would be careful with that assumption. But um, I want to agree with um, Mr. Gosh, Commissioner Gosh, in that I think that it is a great opportunity for that area. And uh, I would err on the side of uh, Commissioner Alturk in saying that I'm concerned based on what the details look like in this. And I mean, it's, it's, it's scary to think that, you know, you're on the edge of gentrification in that neighborhood and you see it uh, very clearly. 
and then how you address it becomes the the kind of next steps in that. And I know that there has to be some uh, a lot of details nailed down in order to do it on the side of council, not on the side of the developer. And so I, I wouldn't try to hold this against you and move it forward. Great, thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? I'm still scared of this thing. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate all the comments and I, I, I'm sure the designers and the owners have, have thought of these things in their process. Uh, I, I, I really feel that this area could use some upgrade. Uh, it can be, I, I think it'll be done well, and when, it's, when it is finished uh, with the Lakewood, I'll call it the Lakewood Shopping Center and all the things that are going on around there, it will be a good mix of residences. Uh, this is a, a challenging site. But, and I'm gonna let my design self, former designer self come through. Sometimes a challenging site can yield some uh, pretty interesting development. And I think I would prefer to leave it up to the designers, uh, all of which are, I know, are very good uh, for how they, develop this site. It will not be a haphazard thing. Uh, and by the time it does d get to the city council, they will have something. I think, Dan, you said you would have something a little more detailed to present. Not so much elevations and all of that, but at least uh, uh, a direction that this thing is going in. So I. I would support this uh, because I think it's needed, even though it is challenging. Uh, the answer could be very surprising for us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Miller? I have a question for staff. Remind me how the affordable housing density bonus works. Is that available at time of site plan? It does not have to, Jamie Sanyak, planning department, it does not have to be committed to at this point. It can be done at any time at the site plan time. It would be fun. But if you avail yourself of the affordable housing density bonus, you are committed then to uh, providing at least a certain percentage of units as affordable housing. It would be accompanied with a commitment moving forward. You couldn't get the bonus without a commitment. Not necessarily in the development plan, but right. there is in order to get the bonus, you have to commit to some affordable units. That's how that works. All right, that's what I thought, yes. and, and it doesn't have to be part of the of the development plan rezoning. No, no. Um, we've had. Um, if you recall, uh, Rose Walk that came through right. uh, last year, they said they may or may not do um, use that when they got ready to develop, and that they didn't commit to it on their development plan, but they held that out as an option. All right, thank you very much. So, to my colleagues, I. I'm concerned about, we talked a lot about workforce housing and, and affordable housing, but there's no commitment, and so it's just talk. I would feel better if this application to adjust the comprehensive plan, the future land use map, was not present here, or, I mean, to, to medium high density. If it went to just uh, what's already there, at least covering partial part of the property, six to 12, 12 units an acre for a, uh, 5.5 or 5.6 unit, excuse me, 5.6 acre site would be 66 units. Um, and I would support this, this, this whole thing if the request was to, to make the uh, future land use map in the area stay consistent and not have this five acre change to higher density showing. Uh, you would still get 66 units on the on the property, and if we're going to put afford affordable units in here, um, you could um, avail yourself of the affordable uh, housing density bonus, and then we get committed affordable units. I would like to see this request, both the future land use map change request and the zoning request changed. 
uh, and brought back to conform to that. A more modest request for changing the future land use map and a reworking of the rezoning uh, with regard to the commitments and the number of units. Uh, and then I wouldn't insist in the development plan that there be a density, uh, a commitment to affordable housing, but I would like to think in order to reach those extra units that they might be able uh, to do that it would come in the form of the bonus. Would the bonus allow you to go over what the future land use map allowed? Or have we, I'm sorry, I'm just not as, as practiced on this as I ought to be. Yeah, and, and we don't, actually that's applied at the time of site plan, so I'm gonna have to look at the ordinance because I know the basics of it, but I don't know. I know you're only looking at the ordinance basis. to make me feel better, and right. I appreciate so it. So the, um, the applicability would be at time of site plan or subdivision. Right. So um, it would get reviewed at that time. There's a minimum, at the current ordinance is a requirement of a minimum of 15 dwelling units. And it says that the project must commit to providing affordable housing dwelling units in the amount of at least 15% of the maximum number of units permitted with the base density. Right, but. So they, they could go over the base density. All right, thank you. I would feel much more comfortable if this, if these requests, these companion requests were structured that way to take advantage of the bonus and we and the community would move forward with committed affordable units rather than conversation about affordable units. I'm becoming fatigued with com conversation about affordable units. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Ghosh? Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I didn't take the applicant's comments to mean that there was any, um, that they intended to make any, uh, even, or, suggest that they were going to provide affordable housing units in the manner that that generally we think of in the um, through the uh, comprehensive plan. I think they were talking about workforce housing, which is at this point a very vague term, but I don't know that they were looking at, uh, you know, something that's affordable to someone with 60% AMI or whatever. I just want to make that, you know, I, did, I, I didn't know that that's what the uh, applicant was. I didn't understand that that's what the applicant was intending on providing affordable housing. And I think they were looking at workforce housing for what it's worth. And I'd invite uh, Mr. Jewell, if you'd like to make any, any additional comments to come to the microphone. Mr. Jewell stands. Any other comments from the commissioners? Yes, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Bryan. Well, I think we've established that this is not going to be an easy piece of property to develop. And I heard mentioned earlier that, you know, with regard to some sewer easements and stuff, I don't know whether there are any sewer lines in those easements, but there might have to be some rearranging done. So when you consider that, I think there may be some hidden costs connected with developing this piece of property. And when I think about that, I think it, it becomes very difficult to request the developer just to, to make commitments to something like uh, affordable housing as much as I'd like to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Gibbs, Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, none of either of these terms uh, to me have, have not been established, affordable housing, workforce housing. Uh, in fact, when we get to Get right down to a place that's going to cater or be done for as affordable housing. You've got to determine what what group are is the target group for a certain affordable housing complex. But that's I, I just wanted to interject that. But I also I wouldn't want to as far as this project. Uh, it seems challenging enough without having to try to find some place for affordable housing. I, as much as I, if they can find, but uh, I wouldn't want to hamstring them in developing this at least for an quote affordable housing, workforce affordable. Uh, again, whatever that means. Uh, but uh, I just I just wanted to throw in there something to be thinking about 
for the future. How are we defining and how are we going to define each of these two terms? Uh, but I, I still would support giving this a go. Uh, if, if the developer comes up with a great answer for this, fine. If they flop, the city council will certainly catch it. And uh, then it'll be up to them to, to worry with. But for right now, it looks, I can see some potential, but it sure ain't gonna be cheap. But that, that's all. Thank you, sir. Great, thank you. We have Commissioner Alturk and then Commissioner Miller, and then I believe we'll be ready to call the question. I just wanted to follow up on Commissioner, Commissioner Miller's um, comment, because I'm not sure that I, I got exactly what you were proposing, but at least for me, I, I plan on voting yes to the increase uh, to the change in the future land use map, because I think that increased density is generally a good thing for affordable housing. Um, and I, I also think that it may give the developer some leeway to develop a number of fair market rate uh, units and then also be able to provide affordable housing, possibly. So uh, that's at least that's my thinking on this. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Miller, you may you may respond to Commissioner El Turk and add your additional comments. Thank you. Very quickly, can we show the map of the the, the proposed future land use map change? Mm -hmm. So if you look at what's proposed, the orange area is medium density residential, which for, for, the, for much of the residential area around this site, that is the kind of the standard in the area. The request is to make a five acre, five and a half acre exception for a higher density unit area, but then in the development plan and the rezoning, to cut that down to less than 20, down to about 15 units an acre. What I would, I think is a more appropriate treatment for multifamily on this property is to change the future land use map for this property to orange, like everything around it for residential. Uh, that would allow, instead of 78 units an acre, 66 units an acre, market units, any kind of units, no, I'm not, and then have a rezoning that would uh, develop the property consistent with that uh, medium density designation, uh, which I think this site can manage. The beauty of our code now is that we have a, a more realistic affordable housing density bonus. So if they wanted to go to 78 units or some number of units over the 66 unit maximum, they could, but they, those units, that additional thing over 66 would be committed affordable units for the next however many number of years. In my opinion, that is a better approach to affordability, and we spent a lot of time talking about affordability, which isn't committed. I'm looking for giving this developer an option to develop this piece of property as multifamily at 66 units um, there for the five and a half acres, and that if they want to do affordable units, they can take, the, take advantage of that density bonus at any time prior to getting their site plan approved. Uh, and then we will actually move forward. Uh, I, I do not like talking about affordable housing when, it's, when there is no path forward for committed affordable housing. There comes a time when we quit talking about the future. Every time we wake up in the morning, it's the present. And the present is the time to actually achieve some affordable housing. So I'm going to vote no on this. I would vote yes for a delay to give these developers a chance to change their request to something closer to what I've suggested. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Um, yes. Yes, Grace Smith, staff would like to just share a matter of information with the commissioners. Um, so in, in the current uh, scheme of the commercial slummed property, if they were to develop the commercial area as residential, they could get up to 14 units per acre. So they could almost do what they're doing. 
They're going to be short a few if because of the residential flum, but they could do that much in that portion of the property now without a change. Mr. Miller? So well, what you're saying is, is that. that with with no uh, change to the comprehensive plan at all, they could pretty much do what they wanted. N not exactly. They could get up to 14 units in the commercially flummed part, not but, the other part. So that, but they would have, that would be, it would be more constipation of the design of the of the property because of that additional line running through it. Potentially, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not a designer, but mm -hmm. uh, it's just more more obstacles in the way. Right. I just wanted to share that though, so you would understand that what's allowed currently under the the split flum because that is kind of a strange or situation that you're seeing on the flum. So. Right. So at any rate, uh, thank you for that information, but it doesn't change my position. Uh, uh, I would support uh, another rezoning and another uh, future land use map change, but not this one and not on the terms that we've discussed here tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Freeman? I just had a, another question as well for staff. And you might not know the answer, but I just want to pose it. What would the timeline look like to adjust the current affordable housing density bonus? I know that um, there are some things in the works to make some changes to the current, the way it currently reads. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't give you the timeline because we just, they're just, it's just now in the works. I mean, it could be several months out. Okay. Yeah, but I do know there are some things underway. And then mm -hmm. just uh, just a quick question, Mr. Dan Jewell. Is Mr. Matt, is it Matt Springer here this evening? Mr. Matt Springer here? Yes. The owner? And um, I just wanna be clear because if it looks like you're talking about doing 78 units of workforce housing completely versus an additional 15 to the 66, I would much rather have the 78 units fully workforce housing and work with Mr. Matt Springer to figure out what that looks like um, in the future, where, however that might work. And if, if we could get some conversation started now on that and, and move this forward so that the property is, move, or so that the project is moving forward, that would be more beneficial to have the 78 rather than just the 15 units of uh, additional affordability. So I just wanna be clear for the folks that are here. Mr. Jewell, any response? Yes, uh, first to, uh, Ms. Freeman's point, uh, yes, the intent is 78 workforce housing units. And that's a, that's a, that's a, I'm on record, that's a commitment we, that we will make on this project. Uh, also, uh, I've appreciated all the conversation. To Mr. Miller's point, yes, I'm tired of beating around the bush on affordable housing. We've been doing this for four years. We need a policy that developers know is the, it's the standard that everybody needs to achieve. Instead of these one-off, you know, what can we get out of these guys? They're trying to bring a product to market competitively to everybody else, and it's just, it takes up way too much of your time, the council's time, and our time. And if there's one priority that this new council should have, it is to go ahead and put the staff effort in place that's needed to get an enforceable policy out there. I have sat on steering committee after steering committee. I've spent a lot of time myself. And we need to do that, folks, because this is, you know, none of us like this. Uh, my final point is this, though. If we're going to promote vibrant, walkable, bikeable places outside of downtown Durham, you know, I can't think of a better place to do it than this, because these people will shop at the food lion, they'll go to the restaurants, they'll patronize the businesses, they will help the economic boost that helped make this shopping center, which let's face it has been dead for 20 years, viable. It'll give them a chance. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell, and certainly appreciate the, the verbal commitment for the 78 workforce housing units as well. With that, I would entertain a motion of- Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Harris. Wait, sorry, I move forward. I have a question about that. So, uh, what, what does that mean? What does the commitment to 78 workforce housing units mean? Just a verbal commitment. Yeah. But what is that? What is work 78 for workforce housing units? Is that a question? Who so would anyone, you like to direct the question yeah. to? Um, anyone in this uh, the, chamber? Jamie Sonyak, Planning Department. <laughs> there is there is no commitment uh, to 
affordable housing or workforce housing. We don't have a definition for that. So while it's mentioned here at the meeting and hopefully enforceable going forward in terms of some sort of movement, um, should you guys recommend this and it go to council, we don't have anything in writing to be able to enforce that. And for the record, I, I plan to make a comment in my notes to the council that, that there was a, a verbal a verbal commitment. This was not a problem, but that it was stated on the record at a public event that the, the proponent has the intent of making that happen. Any, any additional? Thank you. Great. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move forward case number A17. Triple zero, quad triple zero, quad triple zero five. Forward to the city council with a fav favorable recommendation. Second, second. We properly moved and seconded, and uh, moved by Commissioner Harris, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. Although it was close, and <laughs> I would ask for a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Al Turk. Yes. Commissioner Ghosh. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Satterfield. Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Chair Busby? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Motion carries 12 to 1. Thank you. I'll also entertain a motion on the zoning request. Mr. Chair, I move case number Z17 triple forward. The city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. They properly moved and seconded by Commissioner Hyman, and we'll have a roll call vote as well. Commissioner Al Turk. Yes. Commissioner Ghosh. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Satterfield. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Chair Busby. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Miller. No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? No. Motion carries 10 to 2. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry. 11 to 2. My apologies. 11 to 2. We'll move to our next case. This is A. Oh, thank you. A17-00010 and Z17-00022. This is the 5220 Wake Forest mm -hmm. Highway. And we will start with the staff report. Ms. Sonyak. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number A170010 Z170022. This is um, 522 Wake Forest Highway. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to mention um, in terms of the number of units. The applicant, um, while it's mentioned in the staff report and the plan, the applicant is proposing 79 units, residential units, not 80. Um, references to the number of units within the report and the plans um, should be corrected. In addition to that, there was um, the applicant was inadvertently referred to as Ms. Hoffman on page one, and that should also be corrected. The applicant is Tim Sybers of Horvath Associates. The property is located within the city's jurisdiction. It's pending annexation. The FLOM request is from low density residential to low medium density residential. The zoning request is from rural residential to planned development residential 5.362. The site is 14.919 acres. And what is proposed is a multifamily development with 79 units. This is the aerial map and the property is shown in red. It is located within the suburban tier and within the Noose River Basin. 
Residential is the pre predominant use within the surrounding areas. The Ravenstone Residential subdivision, subdivision is located to the south, west, and east. Single family residential homes abut the property on either side, fronting Wake Forest Highway. Directly to the north is vacant agricultural land, and the Ravenstone Commons Shopping Center is less than a quarter mile to the west. This is the existing conditions map. The subject site fronts Wake Forest Highway, east of the Sharon Road intersection. As you can see, not clearly, but you can see it in the plan, there's a single family home, barn, garage, and other accessory structures found currently on the site, all of which are proposed to be removed at the time um, the development occurred or that the request is approved. The site contains a mix of mature hardwood forests and a wetland area, and there are no other environmental sensitive features identified. <clears throat> this is the future land use map. On the left is the existing, and the property is designated as low density residential, shown in sort of the orange, light orange, yellowish color. And on the right, the applicant is proposing low medium density, which would be then consistent with the um, rezoning request. The rezoning request is from rural residential, which is the yellowish color on the left, to the bluish color in the right, which is the planned development residential at a density of four, I'm sorry, at a density of 5.362 units per acre. The property is located within the FJB overlay district. Staff has reviewed this request and found it to be consistent with the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance. <clears throat> the property meets the PDR requirements in terms of density, the maximum impervious coverage, the tree coverage area, um, and the open space requirements, all of which are shown on this slide. This is the um, proposed conditions map for the development plan. In addition to what I've just mentioned um, on, the, on the prior slide, the development plan shows the access points, the building and parking envelopes, the tree preservation areas, and the project boundary buffer, air, buffer areas. In terms of a summary of commitments, the development would be um, proposed as multifamily. <clears throat> a uh, bike lane will be provided along the south side of, of NC-98. There's improvements um, to 98 to become a three lane between the shopping center and Hillview Drive. Additional transportation related improvements and associated design and graphic commitments. Staff has found that the proposal in terms of the FLOM change and its current low density residential is inconsistent and they're seeking a plan amendment to low medium density residential. In terms of the um, rezoning request, it is consistent with policies 2.13D, 2.22B. It is contiguous with other residential developments and compatible with other surrounding uses. There is sufficient infrastructure in place to support the development. The applicant has offered <clears throat> and proffered several text commitments related to improving traffic conditions. The proposed development is consistent with 8.14D since they are committing to additional asphalt to account for, future, for a future bicycle lane. And there is sufficient capacity to accommodate the school children generated from the development. Staff has determined that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you very much. At this point, we'd like to open the public hearing. We have three individuals who have signed up, and we will start with the, the one individual who signed up in favor, and that is Mr. Tim Sivers. And then we have two signed up uh, against the proposal, and we'll, we'll have those individuals come up next. Oh, okay. no problem. 
Mr. Sivers, you have 10 minutes if you'd like to use that full amount of time. Uh, thank you. Hopefully that is not the case. Uh, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates, uh, 16 Consultant Place here in Durham. Uh, thanks to Jamie and the staff members um, for their uh, for their report and working to, with us uh, to this to this date. Uh, this request in front of you tonight does include a future land use map, rezoning, and as well as annexation of this parcel. Uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting. Uh, the church that is uh, just to the uh, just to the east of this site, uh, May fifth, uh, prior to the submittal, we had about twenty five members of the community come out. So it was a pretty good turnout. Um, to the previous question that was asked, I believe, um, Commissioner Hyman, I believe you asked that. We have found in the past that approximately about 10 to 15 percent of the neighbors typically come out of the letters. Uh, for this neighborhood, there was about 200 to 225 letters, and we had about 25 people that attended. So um, that is one of that's that's about typical. Um, since that uh, part of that uh, neighborhood meeting, I did ask for all. Um, email addresses of all the neighbors if they would like to. And since then, I've been providing updates to them. Uh, I probably provided three or four emails to them, uh, providing them updates on submittal dates, and as well as providing them PDFs of the development plan through, throughout the development plan process and review that staff has completed. The site in front of you is one parcel, is just under 15 acres. Uh, it's located south, I'm sorry, located east of NC 98, the Sharon Road intersection. The site is surrounded by commercial and low, and low density residential land uses, and both water and sewer are available at the project limits. A future land use request is a change of the designation from low density residential, which is under four units an acre, to low medium density residential, which is four to eight units an acre. This will provide uh, appropriate transition between the existing commercial and low density residential. It follows existing development patterns in the area as well as meets multiple of the policies, including 2.3.1A, providing continuous development, 231B, which provides services through annexation, as well as 242B, providing uh, connectivity to existing developments. The rezoning request is to change uh, RR to a PDR 5.3 with a maximum of 79 units. You may notice on the development plan, it does indicate 80 units. Uh, staff and I uh, picked up on this within the last 24 hours uh, that it was a calculating error of rounding. Uh, so it, I, I am, that will be a, a change. It is a maximum of 79 units. Uh, this, this rezoning will be a complement to the surrounding commercial nodes as well as the residential subdivision to the south. As uh, staff reviewed, some of the commitments include multifamily residential, construction of NC 98 from a three, for three lanes, uh, from the uh, Hillview to the shopping center to the uh, to the west, an eastbound right turn lane will be included in that, as well as a um, additional asphalt for bike lanes. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've had a few conversations with not only some of the members of the board, uh, but some staff members and um, some original conversations that were and and concerns that were brought to us from the neighborhood meeting. Uh, one of them being uh, the location of the townhomes in retrospect to the, and if I can grab the cursor, in retrospect to the uh, residential homes to the south in Ravenstone. So there's a couple, um, couple commitments I would like to add tonight. Um, I've reviewed these with staff and they are aware of these as well. Uh, one commitment is we'd like to provide, if you can look at the cursor, along this area, the southern property line along Ravenstone, We'd like to provide a 50-foot building setback in here. Uh, the rear setback for townhomes is, is 20 feet, uh, so we'd, we'd like to um, more than increase this by double to, uh, to offset that area from the existing homes. That'll provide approximately 170 feet between any potential townhome location to the back of the residential houses now. Uh, the backyards of these residential houses also, you can see there's a uh, HOA land in here, so there is some landscape buffering in through here. So along with the natural area that is off-site, in addition to this uh, larger setback, I believe that'll provide a better buffer and larger distance from house to house as a dimension. The second and final commitment we'd like to provide tonight is an increase of this landscape buffer adjacent to the uh, vacant commercial land. Uh, we'd like to double that from a 0.27 and a half foot minimum 
to a 0.4 20-foot minimum width. And again, that is along, cursor froze, sorry, there it is. That is along the vacant commercial land mm -hmm. along that parcel. Uh, as mentioned earlier, this application does also include annexation. The property to the south, uh, is, which is Ravenstone subdivision, uh, is in the city limits, so this will be an extension of the existing city limits. Uh, I am available if you guys have any questions. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sivers. And just to confirm with staff, staff has indeed received those proffers and has reviewed those? Yes, Jamie Sonyak, Planning Department. That is correct. Both proffers have been reviewed and are acceptable. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we have two speakers who signed up to speak against. You will have a total of 10 minutes, and if you can come up and uh, give us your name and your address, and we will start with Mr. Jonathan Talley, and then uh, we have, I'm sorry, I can't read this well, Carrie Walk. Walk. okay. Come and look. Uh, Jonathan Talley, um, 220 Hillview Drive. So uh, before I get started, um, I'm no great orator, so... Bear with me as I read a statement, and uh, hopefully I don't take too much time for the next person. Um, thank you for your time, and thank you for your service here for the city and the county and the other roles that you serve. Um, I reside at 220 Hillview Drive. The property is noted as a number six on the development plan by Horvath. Um, I've resided here with my family for eight years, since 2009. In the past, I've served my community as a board member and in many uh, com committee functions for our homeowners association. Uh, our community of Ravenstone borders the proposed development, as was mentioned earlier, uh, to the south, east, and west. Um, I'm here today, today to suggest that we shouldn't move forward with this development at all, but especially not as it is, it is proposed with such high-density housing that isn't really contiguous with the other areas. Uh, first, Ravenstone was established just before the last recession and would become a three-phase, 400-site, single-family home community zone with about quarter-acre lots uh, common areas, green space, clubhouse, those type of things. Uh, after the recession, those that remained in the community saw development return to our area with another 100 <coughs> plus so housing uh, community to the south, the Meadows at Ravenstone. Uh, also planned with similar lot sizes, green space. Uh, this development was, this development as proposed would include higher density housing um, than those homes in my community and in the neighboring developments. Uh, next, the impact of this development would have on our sewer infrastructure uh, hasn't really been determined and I think is underestimated. Uh, in initial meetings with the developer, he stated that there would be sewer upgrades in the new community to handle the new stress on infrastructure. I know that several times a year we already have overflowing manhole covers in our own community. Uh, those drain into our streets, into stormwater drains, and into our creek. Uh, this new development would only hinder and hurt that condition. Um, furthermore, storm runoff also plays a significant role ecologically damaging uh, to our community. Ravenstone has a BMP structure directly adjacent to the southwest border of the proposed development. In reality, it's downstream from that existing body of water and wetland um, that is slated to be paved over to connect to our community. Um, environmentally speaking, excuse me, financially, this runoff could cause havoc in our community, common area, and the pool that is near that BMP. Speaking from experience again, I know that our community has spent tens of thousands of dollars to maintain a function compliant, environmentally friendly, safe BMP structure. Um, this included dredging tons of silt that accumulated in less than 10 years since the community was, was built at that time. Regardless of the intensity of development at the proposed site, Ravenstone residents will be the ones that must deal with the water, silt, wildlife impacts, and financial costs downstream. The interest into this de new development would be directly off of Highway 98, as was mentioned, and I just, mm -hmm. stepping off the script here, um, I would not ride a bike on that road now, so I'm fearful of the bike lane. Um, to say that there are traffic issues on the highway would be a drastic understatement. Several hours in the morning and evening are congested for miles in each direction to Highway 7098 interchange, um, as well as almost a Wake Forest in the other direction. Uh, taking Sharon Road towards Miami Boulevard and into the park, RTP, bears the sa uh, same result. I currently drive back roads to my job in Raleigh, Leesville Road to 540 for my commute. This route will be soon overwhelmed with the thousands of homes that are being added from Carolina Arbors and expanding 
Briar Creek developments making their way from the south. So what should we do with the proposed land? As has been done in other areas in Durham and is laid out in the city and comp county comprehensive plan, the ultimate and long-term needs of the community should be addressed, not the short-term concerns of today. If we continue to grow in our area, adding higher density housing without the means to support, support it or with proper parks, transportation, and infrastructure, sewer, roads, we will fail our long-term goals. Packing in additional housing on every plot of land and bottlenecking our transportation corridors will deny any future options for mass transit, greenways, or city and county parks without impacting those homes that are already existing. Today in Ravenstone community, this is what I find pretty important, there are several tracts of land that are deeded to the Triangle Greenways Council. There are several of them on the map and some down to the south. Uh, they connect and snake their way through undeveloped areas in our community. Uh, when our community was initially developed, the intention was that eventually they would connect with other communities, providing a similar network of trails and greenways as is found in other parts of Durham, Raleigh, Cary. The proposed development would further landlock these parcels, bottlenecking us in where we can't extend that land and finding some other use for it. Um, so commissioners, I ask you to take a step back from the map, consider our long-term goals. What do we want to make a priority in the residential areas in East Durham? It seems today like early 2000s. We again find ourselves in a period of unprecedented growth, which is a good thing. Growth brings revenue and revenue brings, provides services and recreations to our citizens. However, there must be land to build those future parks, greenways and recreation fields. My community is quickly finding itself far away and a congested drive to those services in other parts of the, the city and county. Before recommending any additional higher density housing development on these smaller parcels, please consider reserving this land for future planned city and county services or keeping it rural residential. Thank you, respectfully. And one final comment, I've been to the planning meetings. We have, in my opinion, had quite a good turnout, 25 folks, and everyone that I spoke to has opposition to this. Some of them are here today. Um, and that is all. Thank you, Mr. Talley. Ms. Woke, and apologies if I'm getting your, pronouncing your name wrong. Hi, my name is Carrie Woke. I live at 5602 Dude Ranch Road in Durham. And so I, um, I've lived in my house for almost 13 years and I've watched the development creep ever closer. Um, of course, I chose to live where I live because it was rural. Um, and so I also work in Raleigh and I used to drive down Mineral Springs and there was, there was meadows there and there were meadow larks. It's a species of bird that lives in meadows. Um, I used to take my daughter to the pumpkin patch at Ganyard Farm right here where we're talking about. So with every forest that's destroyed and every farm that's bulldozed, we lose a little bit more of what's making living in this part of Durham so special and so wonderful. So we have so little left. Um, the de developments are just closing in. So we're not only losing the trees and the wildlife, in and of themselves, which is a terrible thing, but we're losing our connection to these things. Um, we're, you know, we're becoming more and more distant from the birds and the turtles and the foxes because we're running them over. Um, they have nowhere to return from migration. So people living and growing up in these areas where their nature was destroyed, they're not even gonna know what these animals were or that they used to live there. And that ignorance, with that ignorance comes apathy, and with that apathy um, pe allows people to do more and more terrible things, and things to happen in our world. So I'm against the proposed rezoning. I think that development should be smart, and that we should set our, wildlife, our wild lands aside for wildlife that we're lose, so rapidly losing I think we need to concentrate our building efforts closer to downtown and we need to build up, not out. Um, I thought the first proposal was very interesting. I think we need to keep our low density farmland and our forests as they are. For once it's gone, we cannot get it back. So what will happen to our wildlife? It's gone forever. Our landscape is being altered. 
So we could tear down those houses where the meadow larks were, we could plant the grasses, but those meadow larks will not return. They're gone forever and ever. Um, so let's think about the world that I want my daughter to grow up in. I want the world where there's some native biodiversity. I want her to see the different trees and birds and snakes and lizards and all the different animals that we have that are, I see it disappearing every single year. Um, there's places on the East Coast that's just subdivision and strip mall and subdivision and strip mall. And I don't wanna see this area turn into that. So this is a rural part of the county, and I would really like to see it that way. And I'd like to see um, this land be, used, made, be put to a better use than high density residential. So as was proposed, a park or open space, something that with the development that we have now, there's a place for people to go to have that connection to nature. So I really appreciate the opportunity to have my voice heard, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woke, and for the record, I wish I lived on Dude Ranch Road as well. <laughs> it is a great name. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak for the public hearing before we close the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and I'll ask for commissioners with questions or comments. Great. Uh, Commissioner Alturk, we'll start with you. If the other commissioners don't mind keeping your hand up just for a moment. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question for Tim, um, or just, I guess, general comment about this proposal or this uh, application. I mean, it, uh, you know, the staff report and I think the justification statement says this is a good transition um, at least when I look at the map, it looks less like a transition and more like a donut in some ways, right? There is some commercial to the, to the west and a little bit to the east, but there are some properties right around it that are still really low density or, you know, under four units an acre. And then to the north, it's all under, you know, two units an acre. So um, I guess I'm a little skeptical that this kind of would constitute contiguous development. But the, and so on that note, I mean, if, even if we accept that, um, you know, you're, you are committing to uh, road improvements and, the, you know, the extra asphalt for the bike lane. But one of the comments that the, the pedestrian and the uh, bicycle and pedestrian advisory commission um, brought up, uh, their comment number two, suggested that you also consider uh, sidewalk along 98 from the site to the shopping center. And um, again, you know, kind of like the last case, we, we hear from developers a lot of times, you know, we'll review that site plan. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if you're committing to a three lane um, section here and a bike lane, why not go ahead and come? I mean, are there reasons that you cannot commit now to also a sidewalk? I think. This is probably this is uh, this is not the most walkable part of town, obviously. But you know there is a shopping center right there, and um, and you do hear a lot about 98 being a very dangerous road, and um, so I, I just wanted to uh, bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, let me let me speak first on the transition, and then I'll talk about the the sidewalk and, and um, along the right of way. Uh, the, the transition is, um, if, you, if you think about NC-98 being that highly traveled corridor, um, north of NC-98, yes, there's a very limited sewer and water uh, to, the, to the north of NC-98, and, and I think NC-98 is, is that, that border. Um, there, yes, there is the transition between the commercial uses on the end. Um, there is that still that one piece that still has the lower designation. Um, but a lot, you've seen... Um, and I can't remember, it's about, uh, it's a little further towards the city, uh, city limit or downtown, that there's uh, some of these recent developments have, have had residential back off of the NC-98 and more townhomes towards it, uh, to the front. Um, I believe, again, I can't think of, recall the name of it, there's a family, I know there's either a family dollar or a dollar store or something, right, um, it, along NC-98. Uh, it might, no, it's, it's for, I think it's further out than Ganyard. Um, I, either way, that's, that's really the transition is, 
is going from the lower, the lower, um, the lower residential to that higher, real busy NC um, NC98 corridor. Um, I have, I did live in that area. I don't live there anymore, but uh, NC98 is very well traveled. Um, and, and to transition into your your um, statement about the sidewalk, um, even even Mr. Talley mentioned, you know, he doesn't want to go on NC98 before biking. Uh, yes, we're providing additional asphalt for the bike lane. There are a lot of bicyclists bicyclists that use NC98 to travel over to um, Olive Branch. Um, but uh, the connection on the side through here, uh, if I was living in this neighborhood and I wanted to travel or walk or bike to, um, to the shopping center, as the resident himself said, I wouldn't go on NC98. I would go through the subdivision around um, and to, to the, uh, over to Sharon Road, which connects into the shopping center itself. Um, so the, between that and uh, there would be additional right-of-way that is needed along NC98, um, uh, depending on the design, whether it be a curb and gutter or a ditch section along the edge. Um, this, I don't know if I can follow in, I believe this section right in here, there was also was approved for a... Um, what was it, a, uh, rest uh, maybe a habitat restore or something like that was just approved. So there is more sidewalk that's gonna be developed along there. Um, that'll be a requirement of that parcel. Um, but, uh, but making that connection, I will definitely discuss that with the developers. Uh, there is a historic home um, that is right adjacent to it. Um, in the conversations I've had with that homeowner, they would prefer not to have that sidewalk developed. Um, but I will definitely go back and, and discuss it with the developer and discuss it with that homeowner as well. Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you, Chair Busby. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to touch on some of the things I heard from the, from the uh, neighbors. Uh, one, one of them was about the stormwater BMP, and I, and I understand that you guys have had some difficulty. There you are. I understand that you guys have had some difficulty uh, in your subdivision, um, however, you know my understanding of what the stormwater requirements are in Durham is that they're very stringent and that they are uh, uh, among the most stringent in this area, meaning like in the Triangle. Um, and uh, you know, to the extent that this property currently contributes to the problems you all face in your stormwater BMP, which is just south of this property. Uh, I would expect that new development on the site would actually improve that. There are no storm, stormwater measurements on this site. Um, and so I, I, you know, if whatever's running off this site is not being treated at all before it gets to yours. Um, and so, you know, I think that new development on the site actually would, has the potential to uh, make that a better situation for you all. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to a uh, concern raised by you both which is, you know, what, what can we, what kind of services can we provide to this part of town? Um, and, you know, I think a park would be great in this area, um, but, you know, to suggest that this uh, property owner should be the one who, on whose prop, on, you know, whose property where the park should go, I think is, you know, a little bit unfair. Um, you know, if someone said that your house ought to be a park instead of a house, I think maybe you'd, you know, it, it, you could put yourself in the in that situation. At the end of the day, someone does own this piece of property, and and you know, I don't know how long they've owned it or whatever, but you know, you have to think about um, the 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 property owners in this situation and and really what their uh, intent or what their what their situation is. And I don't know. I mean, this could be their their way to retire or whatever. I don't know. Um, but you know, when when you suggest that instead of a subdivision, the whole 15 acres should be a park. I think that um, can sometimes fall on deaf ears because I, I don't know that it's very, that's a reasonable uh, request. Uh, I will note, and I was surprised that I didn't hear um, some concerns related to the connection. I, I mean, it's required by the UDO to make that connection into the adjacent subdivision. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was total, fully expecting to get some comments on that, but I didn't. Um, and I guess uh, that probably means that everyone understands that it's a requirement rather, rather than they're happy with it. But uh, I, I did just want to touch on that. 
will say I thought that for this development, I thought there were a lot of uh, road improvements that were being committed to, so I commend the developer on that. Uh, as far as the density, it's, again, it's one of the situations, they are asking for a flum amendment, but they're not looking for the top end of that next flum, they're just over the, uh, the, the current flum. Uh, kind of begs the question, maybe you could do less, or, you know, the way I see it is, you know, it, in my opinion, more density is better because through, only through density are we gonna be able to get any kind of affordable housing. Um, you know, affordable housing on half acre lots, it's not possible. So we have to have some, some sort of density as we develop these uh, vacant areas in, in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Satterfield. Uh, I'll just pick up where he left off just by saying that um, it's a relatively small parcel and um, developing parcels like this at a higher density allow us to protect even larger tracts of open space and, and areas where there are um, much more significant natural resources. So while I can empathize as well, um, I just uh, affirm what was just said about that. But my comment really had more to do with the, um, with the sidewalk issue. Um, I'm very concerned about connectivity with sidewalks and I don't want to predict where somebody may or may not want to walk along 98 or take another route to the shopping center. But I think it's short-sighted to uh, plan a development where you're not going to provide connectivity with existing sidewalks along those uh, other parts of Highway 98. So I would like to see a proffer to include a sidewalk along the frontage of 98 for this development. Can't do it off big proffers. Thank you, Commissioner Satterfield. Commissioner Miller. I have a couple of questions. Uh, so the staff report refers to uh, multifamily, but the um, commitments in the development plan talk about townhouses. Is this a townhouse committed development? Do you want to speak to that? The, the, intent, the current intent is a townhome development, yes. Um, does so that my question is, is it going to be townhouses or is it, I mean, is it, are we committed to townhouses or this, could this be apartments? It's, it's not clear to me what the word townhouses, as it's used in the commitments, actually means. In, in my, Jamie Sonyak, Planning Department, without the specification between townhomes or apartments, multifamily, and I'll check the definition, but multifamily could infer either. That was my, my thinking, too. Are you committing to townhouses, Tim? Uh, yes, we can commit to townhouses. This is, this is not, not at all by any means planned to be an apartment complex. No, I, I would... Like I said, I used to live out there, and this, um, as as once mentioned earlier, this is apartments would not fit here. It doesn't make sense to build apartments here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there some way that you can show the commission members and the people in the audience the uh, today's proffer of the 50 foot building set back along that southern boundary line? I would like for everybody to see that and take that visual image into consideration and how they decide the case. And while she's working on that. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, kind of in response to what my colleague, Mr. Ghosh, said about uh, what the uh, neighbor's concern about stormwater BMPs and siltation, the current property uh, currently has about, gosh, 4.5% impervious surface based upon my rough calculation. Um, the proposed development will run that up to 50%, a maximum of 50%. Uh, impervious surface. The current property does have a large pond, which I'm assuming collects a great deal of the runoff from the, this, this property, which has got a lot of uh, topographical variation on it. Um, it. And so I think it is a reasonable thing to be concerned about what will happen downstream when you jump from 4.5% uh, impervious surface to 50% impervious surface. And then I will also point out, too, that we approve a great many uh, projects where the impervious surface is much more than 50%. So I can't say that I'm terribly alarmed, but I do want to say that I think it is premature to project that, uh, that stormwater runoff conditions on, uh, in this area will be improved by the development of this property. I certainly can't say that, and I, I wouldn't, uh, without more information or more expertise than I 
currently possess. Uh, can we see that map? Yes. So I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Talley, who, who lives actually, whose house backs up to this uh, development, um, if this extra f uh, 50 feet, which will function as a setback, not as a vegetative buffer, is that correct? It's a building setback. In other words, no building on the subject property will be built closer to the property line than the red line shown there. Uh, does that offer you any solace at all, sir? And if you want to speak, come to the mic. Yes. <clears throat> Jonathan Talley, 220 Hillview Drive. Um, my con so, uh, first off, again, my home is the number six mm -hmm. um, on the map, and I have neighbors uh, to the left and right of me that are much closer than 50 feet, and I don't have a problem with a, with a home being close to me. Um, the setback, uh, I, I'm not sure what it would look like. If it would be flat surface, if it would be a mound that you normally see on the side of a road with some sort of landscaping on it, or if it would just be clear cut uh, grass and weeds that would grow up. So the, the point of my question to, to Mr. Sivers is that's a setback. He's not guaranteeing that in that area there will be plantings. Uh, there is no project boundary buffer in that area because of the that area in your subdivision, which is de, uh, designated 15, I believe that's a tree save area in your area. So with that that land there, and because his property doesn't actually back up to the back of your lot, he's not required to include a project boundary buffer that would have plantings to a certain opacity. Uh, but he has added this um, uh, this building setback, saying that that it would be 50 feet on that side. It looks like it's about a like distance on your side uh, for number five and perhaps uh, 75 feet for your lot itself because of the way that that strip gets narrower and narrower. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if that if that interval uh, in there uh, made you feel a little bit better about at least some aspects of this project. Um, thank you. Yeah. the. Uh the distance uh, is better than not having distance right now. Um, on on the majority of that space, there's tree coverage. Uh, that's a, uh, as you mentioned, a tree zone. And um, from my experience, uh, areas between property lines that are um, not tree coverage areas, but are kind of no man's land, um, don't get mowed, don't get attended to. There's trash that accumulates there that nobody owns and decides. What to do with so um, if it was something that was woods that would be better yeah and so if i may mr chairman one other uh kind of thing i've wanted to ask mr sivers after have visiting the property and looking between the the um the houses over there i actually peered up between your back your side yard and your neighbors uh when i was on hillview it looks like the land falls off for a distance and then rises again. And the highest point would be that hill, which is about uh, elevation 384, um, which is kind of right in the southern center of your property. But it drops down and up. And I know that in order to develop this property, you anticipate a lot of grading. Will the property still, uh, will, you, will you grade inside that building set back line, do you anticipate? Yes, there will be some minor grading. Uh, there, there's, um, and Jamie, can you assist me with getting back to the existing conditions plan? Is it the same sheet? Oh, I can do that. Got it. Okay. So you can see some of the elevations that mm -hmm. Commissioner Miller was, was talking about. Um, let me switch tasks here. Oh, these numbers are better. When I said, pardon me, everybody, when I said 380, I meant 360. Uh, this is much clearer than the, than yeah. the copy so, we had in our... So I believe um, Mr. Talley said he was uh, owner number six, which is right here. So you can see the area behind him is very similar in topography, and it falls off back here. So these houses here, for example, are about six to eight foot higher than the uh, the land uh, along the uh, along the property line, mm -hmm. and the same in this area. These houses actually 
are, um, are actually lower as there's a little bit of an area that comes down through here. So these houses here are about six to eight foot lower than this area. Um, and, and the main reason actually why we brought this, this additional prop for tonight was really for these houses, although we're applying it to the entire southern boundary, is really for these houses that are sitting uh, a little bit lower and that may be looking up at the townhomes behind them. Even though there is a, is a large natural area back here um, on parcel of their land and on HOA land, we wanted to push that building set back a little bit further so that so these residents um, weren't weren't looking up the hill at, at a townhome. That is correct. Did you talk with your client about the possibility of extending the project boundary buffer, which runs from the along that eastern uh, limit down um, oh, in, into this area that we're discussing now? Uh, we have not discussed that yet, but I will I will write that down and discuss that with the developers. And then I have um, you and I talked about this, and I appreciate the time that you gave me and and uh, your responses. Um, as you know, uh, you and I talked about my concern over uh, uh, design functionality and, and good good residential design. Um, and you responded to me saying that that the that your de your developer client proposes to uh, that most of the units will have single bay garage doors. Yes. Would you be willing to make a uh, design commitment saying that uh, the majority of the units will only have one bay one garage one bay garage doors? What is your definition of majority, sir? 50% plus 50%, one unit. 50% or more. Yeah, I think I think that's that's absolutely a, a commitment that we can provide tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You've been very patient. Just, Jamie Sonyak, just to be clear. So the language that you are agreeing to would be something like... Um, the majority. No less than 50% of the residential units will have. Um, I would just say the majority. Well, we need we need some quantification. So majority would be 50 or more, I would assume. 50% plus one <laughs> is customarily how you define a majority. 51. 51% of the units will have at least one bay. I'm perfect. We'll, we'll have no more than a one bay garage door. No more something. No, no more garage doors than one bay or something. And just to be clear, Mr. Sivers, this statement, this is the proffer you're comfortable yes, putting 50, forward? Yes, yeah, 51%. If, we put a, a, if we, I understand we do have to put a number on it, yes, and 51%. Um, yeah, no, no more. Uh, at least 51% of the homes will have no more than a one-car, one garage door, a one, a, I guess a single, I believe. Single bay garage. Single bay garage. Um, the, the terminology now, they don't... Techno you know, terminology, we don't like to use a single car or a double car because of the different sizes of cars now. So we use, yeah, um, it's, yes, so, yes, that is fine. <laughs> Great, Ms. Sunyak, you, you have, you've captured that and that's, a, that's uh, acceptable from staff's perspective for this evening? That's correct. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you, staff. You're welcome. Great, uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle? I just have some comments, sir, is, you know, is, is, as far as like the sidewalk and bike lanes, I wouldn't ride a bike out on that part of Highway 98 if I had to. It's, 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 you, it's, I think that's just a recipe for a disaster. And uh, I have concerns about uh, it's, the people off of uh, Hillview. I, I, you've heard me say before, I was a deputy sheriff and I investigated numerous accidents at Highway 98 and Hillview, Highway 98 and Olive Branch, Highway, uh, that whole section through there. And I, I just can't see the, uh, the, any more, how it can support any more down in there. Even adding a lane down to the uh, Minerals uh, Sharon, the, uh, the Sharon Road intersection at the shopping center from 6 in the morning till, you know, 8, 30, 9 o'clock and in, in, the, in the evenings up until 7, 7, 30. I, I just I, I just have a problem with uh, with, with the additional traffic that will be created, and I just don't think that's going to be sufficient to to, uh, to, to handle it, uh, additional traffic in there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Van. Okay. All right. All right. Um, 
Uh, well, first, I, I want to thank some of my colleagues who've already spoken. Let me just note, um, you know, I've lived out in this area for about uh, 13 years. Um, I still live in Grove Park. And I um, know this area like the back of my hand. And, uh, and, and I get the idea that, you know, this is among some of the last, what I call, virgin territory in that area. I get that. Um, um, but, you know, I always, I always remind myself, though, um, at the end of the day, you have to always look at what I call the impact, right? And so the impact is, you know, what's the impact on the neighborhoods, hoods that are adjacent to that property, um, the impact certainly on the roads. And for me, like I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough to um, d delay going to work because I don't want to deal with traffic and delay leaving work to come home because of traffic. Uh, and so, you know, traffic to me is it's a big issue out there. And I know among many of the neighbors out there. And so I, I'm, I'm glad, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm glad um, that you, you addressed some of the commitments that are here. Um, and, and I'm glad you had uh, about 25 folk at the meetings. But I'll be uh, curious to know, um, in terms of some of the responses that other neighbors had, there are 25 there, and you said you've been emailing them. Uh, are there any concerns maybe that you've tried to address with them relative to what concerns that were raised, such as ones that were brilliantly stated earlier? And if you had, how, you know, what, what, what did you offer? Yes, sir. Um, there, there, I have had some, uh, some email. Um, once those emails have been sent out, I have had some email responses from some of the neighbors. Um, and some of the some of the issues that were brought up tonight have been uh, made, uh, we're aware of. Uh, traffic is absolutely no matter where we go in Durham always one of the uh, the prime items. Um, you can you've seen that the uh, the, the text commitments that we've provided uh, for you know a, a um, 79 units now and not 80 but for 79 um, townhome units. Uh, Financially, that that is, uh, as it was mentioned earlier by the members of the board, that is a a, um, a large amount. It's a it's a it's a large financial uh, commitment on 79 units. Um, in addition, one item I've discussed with some of the neighbors is that uh, I believe uh, it's previously known as Doc Nichols and Sierra over off of Doc Nichols Road. Uh, the rezoning that is um, in there, they that plan and that rezoning is uh, required to put a traffic light up on um, at the Owl Branch and NC-98. Um, that will be a huge help to this area. Um, the other item that I've uh, sent to the neighbors and um, encouraged them to go and make discussions and comment on is the NC-98 corridor plan. Um, I sent the link all to, to the neighbors and said, hey, go check out this plan, make your comments. Um, there, there's... Um, conceptual plans right now for not only Mineral Springs and Sharon, but um, that NC-98 quarter plan goes from all from Durham all the way to Wake Forest, uh, a 25, 30 mile stretch there that that NC-98 quarter plan is looking at. So I, I made sure, I wanted to make sure that all the neighbors were aware of this and, and, and sent that link out to the neighbor to the, in the email as well. Um, I, I've, I've had some general conversations about the sewer uh, that with the city. Uh, I re recently, I believe it was about six weeks ago, six to eight weeks ago, city council did finally accept the streets. Um, so so um, I take that as the sewer issues have been resolved. Uh, the last conversation I had with, with the city was about probably 10, 12 weeks ago um, when they were preparing for that. So I will reach back out to the city uh, engineering and discuss some of those items with them because obviously there are still some issues. So we'll, we'll discuss that with them as well. Um, the the stormwater absolutely will will meet uh, you know it'll meet UDO requirements um, which will which in, in my opinion uh, provide better uh, better stormwater relief across the property line. Uh, the existing pond that is shown on here is is and I, one item I did want to clarify this pond was drained by the um, the property owner um, so this pond does not exist right now it is a it's it's a, a hole in the ground if you will. Uh, before this development um, was, was started with us, this, uh, the pond was drained again by the homeowner. Um, so, so that itself, um, you know, is not holding any water right now. The water is just simply draining down to the BMP in, in the Ravenstone subdivision um, by us collecting all the impervious area that we will, um, we will be adding to the site and providing a stormwater detention for it. It'll not only slow that water down to the adjacent properties to the south and to the west is where it will will drain, but it will help treat those nutrients as well. So. Okay, and thank you very much. You're and, and may I ask at least one of the residents um, who spoke, either of you, uh, who may have um, any response back to that, just to be sure. I mean, I know what you said, nothing personal. No, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner Vaughn. Um, the acceptance of the streets uh, is a very uh, a long discussion, but basically what was done, um, as it happened right in front of my house, was that they ripped up about this much pavement and dirt and then paved back over the top of it. So the infrastructure, the sewer, the um, stormwater drains weren't really touched. We just elevated the pavement so that the, the street was no longer a river that it drained into the stormwater drain. Um, and I had a few other comments, if that's all right. Um, so the sidewalk, going back to that, um, my view on the, on the bike lane is a bit different than the sidewalk. Um, a, a sidewalk put off of Highway 98 probably would help uh, people in the community if we do go down the road of development. Um, the historic home is pretty well offset from the, from the road, so I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. I have a sidewalk uh, 20 feet in front of my house, so that's my opinion on, on sidewalks. Um, and then the wetland, and there's actually a sewer, a, uh, an underground sewer pipe, uh, excuse me, not a sewer pipe, a uh, underground stormwater pipe that is between uh, these homes, four and five. Um, so that also drains down and gets quite flooded during storms. Um, you can note the elevation over here um, near the pond and the, and the wetland. Um, so really, oh, whether the, the pond was drained or not, it, there's a lot of water that flows already down here. And then with the additional impervious surface, that's gonna increase that flow quite a bit. Um, and if I can back up all the way to uh, a comment on a park, uh, I understand completely. I wouldn't be uh, distraught about someone telling me that I had to give up my home uh, for a city park. I'm not talking about annexation for, for a park. And I'm just trying to throw out other ideas um, for land use in this area. Um, if you look around, there's no parks in our area. And if we do develop all the land, which I, again, have no problem. I moved into a suburb. It's partially my fault and everyone else's fault that, you know, homes like these are developed. No problem at all. But when you have uh, a resource that is dwindling, um, and we're really cramming in higher density housing into a small parcel of land. Maybe not this one, but if we always say no, then there won't be any land left for parks and services for, for folks around me. So, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Van, any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, could you come back up to the mic, Mr. Crowley? And, and I'd ask the commissioners to ask specific questions when you call people up, and if the respondents can address those specific questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm at least going to start with you. I, I'm still a little vague as to how the stormwater runoff situation is in this whole neighborhood uh, surrounding this uh, proposed new neighborhood. Uh, is your area of residence the only area that's experiencing, I'll say, uh, stormwater runoff situations, intolerable situations, or is it pretty much generally, depending on the rainfall, I guess, but just generally a problem in this whole area? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Um, Generally speaking, um, a lot of the areas in our community have issues. They're separate and uh, have various reasons. One of them was that the fact that the streets were not finished for um, the majority of the life of this community and stormwater flowed in the same place that cars drove um, and didn't go into these stormwater um, collection areas. So eventually it would just overflow the curb and go into an area that was not meant to capture uh, stormwater for 10 years. Um, the, the second issue, uh, from my experience on the board, which is not current, but in the past, uh, we spent around $40,000 to $50,000 to bring this BMP up to code. Uh, because, again, um, many of you may be familiar with uh, the failed communities in Durham. Um, we had to spend a lot of money on this because it was not built properly or finished by a developer, so the residents paid for this. So that was a stormwater issue, um, another one that, I was, that we were dealing with. And I'm not sure if I can scroll on this map, but to the south, when I was mentioning the, the Meadows community, um, 
again, I was on the board for when that community came about, and we had several homeowners that were saying, um, their building homes are grading, all this silt, all this clay is coming off of where they're grading into our backyards. Uh, personally, I didn't have that. Um, I may in the future. Um, but those are the, the concerns that I have about stormwater. Yeah, and this is something that I've thought about for four years. Uh, I, everything that comes up, I think about how, what impact a development is having as far as stormwater, uh, of course, all the other infrastructure issues, but stormwater is something, no matter how hard we try to pipe and direct this stuff, reality and people who live in situations uh, usually tells a different story. Water has a way of, of finding its way. And in a situation like this, uh, just as a general statement, uh, I think an overall study of storm water uh, from the existing to and through the new and whatever uh, mitigation can be accomplished, that's fine. But um, that that's a, just a general statement. But uh, it, and an example of what I'm talking about is that the state has spent millions of dollars down Mineral Springs, uh, down down Mineral Springs over uh, to uh, Valleydale Drive. Uh, it still floods, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of what I was getting at. I would feel much better if this, uh, the density of this area could be more in keeping with, with what's there. Uh, so I'm going to give it some thought between now and voting time. Uh, I think that's all the comments I have, uh, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. We've got a few more commissioners, so you have a little more time to ponder your decision. We've got uh, Commissioner Bryan and then Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll admit, I'm on the fence with this one. I think that the general area is suitable for residential development. I like the idea of a PDR because you can cluster homes and then maybe preserve more trees and some more open space and, and maybe you'll still have a few birds and foxes and other animals around. What bothers me is the density. I don't see it really as a buffer. I see it surrounded primarily by low density residential and I'd be much happier if it were low-density residential. And I guess my question is, is there any way this could be done at the low-density residential? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. And, and um, financially, at four units an acre, the project does not work. Um, between the open space requirements, the tree save tree coverage requirements, stormwater quality, um, those items in particular take probably um, 30, 35 percent of the site, uh, if not more. That may be on the conservative side. Um, and, and, and the cost of those items, in, in addition to the cost of the road improvements at this time, four units an acre uh, would, would not financially work for this project. Um, part of this request, is, as was mentioned also, is yes, we're, we're requesting for the future land use to be four to eight, but you know, we're, not, we're not capping that out. Um, we're, we're, we're trying not to um, pack these units in here. We're, we're requesting 5.3 something, um, which, which is on, on the lower half of that uh, four to eight units an acre. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. Um, two things. One, I want to say thanks. I, I had forgotten. I had written that down about the, uh, um, <clears throat> you said there was a problem with the overflowing of, this, of the street in your neighborhood, but I think I understand what occurred. It sounds like they changed the grade of the road or sloped it a little bit more so that the water actually runs into the uh, stormwater 
um, devices, and, and hopefully that helps. And I, I take your point. They streets were recently uh, accepted by the city, so I imagine that is the fix that they worked out. I did have a question for staff related to the sidewalk. Uh, this issue has come up a couple times, and I'm just, I mean, I, I guess you could commit to whatever you wanted to, but generally speaking, I mean, my understanding was that, um, you know, where sidewalks are required, the developer will be required to build them along the frontage of their property, um, and, and that the city wouldn't have any other way to, I don't wanna say force, but require a developer to build sidewalk uh, beyond their property. Uh, I just want to verify if that's correct, and, and I think we heard also that there wasn't enough uh, existing right-of-way along 98 in this section to do uh, the road improvements and a sidewalk. I just want to verify those two things with staff. Okay. Uh, Jamie Sonyak, Planning Department. I, I don't want to speak for Mr. Judge, but I sort of asked him the same question that you just asked, whether or not with the widening of 98, whether or not sidewalks could be accounted for when they did that improvement, um, he felt that it, it's, it's very possible. It depends on the width of the right-of-way there, um, and it would have to be surveyed and, and figured okay, so out. We don't but, know what the width of the right-of-way there. Correct. Okay, that's fine. Is that, and here he comes, so he probably has something else to okay. add. Bill Judge, transportation. Yeah, without knowing the exact width of the right of way, that, that's difficult to answer. I have not seen a survey on that that property, but in generally speaking, if the right of way is greater than 60 feet, I would think that there probably would be adequate room for three lanes and a sidewalk. Um, maybe needing to do curb and gutter or, or some aspect of that nature in order to, to provide the drainage ditch. Um, but the first part of your question, yes, yeah, sidewalks are, required for the front edge of the site. They would have the option by right to do a payment in lieu long um, NC-98, assuming it's annexed by the city. Mm -hmm. I believe the request from the Bike Ped Commission was for that off-site sidewalk section yeah, between the site and the shopping center, which would need to be a proper. Yeah, okay. And uh, do you know, happen to know what that right-of-way is there? I, 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 staff was not aware and uh, I don't. you guys have surveyed it. I, I, I believe it is over 60 feet. Um, along the frontage, we'll actually will have, and let me scroll out here so I can get to the proposed plan. Uh, along the frontage with our right turn lane, will actually be four lanes because there'll be a yeah, eastbound right. and westbound lane. There'll be a westbound left turn lane and an eastbound right turn lane. So in this area right here, and not and, and to mention tapers as well. So it's actually four would be four lanes right along our frontage. Um, there. I, I, I will have to go back and research this. Okay. Really well, if you don't know what the right, that, that's fine. I, I would, thought I'd ask the question. I know it came up uh, as an issue a couple times, but okay, that's, those were the questions I had, I think. Great, Hopefully thank you. Uh, Commissioner Alturk, and then I'll entertain a motion. So just can I, can I follow up on that? So for staff, I mean, is, is there any harm if the applicant wanted to commit to this and then they find out that, okay, they can't do it because of right away and four lanes and all that? I mean, there's no harm in proffering, right? I mean, they well, would have to. It's the same thing as if anything is on a development plan and something then cannot be accounted for at the time of development, they would then have to come back for the modification to the planning commission. So. Thank you. Great. I would. Uh, I would. Entertain a motion, but I would ask that the motion do include noting the proffers that we've heard this evening as part of the proposal. Mr. Chairman, then in uh, conformity with your request, I move that we send, uh, let's make sure I get my numbers right here, case A170010. Uh, forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. And this is the plan amendment, so there are no proffers associated with that. Second. Very properly moved and seconded. And I would ask for a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Commissioner Ghosh? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Satterfield? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Chair Busby? No. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. 
Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. Commissioner Van? No. Commissioner Gibbs? No. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Motion carries eight to five. If I may, Mr. Chairman, um, I move that we send case Z17-00022 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation on condition that uh, the uh, rezoning uh, request include in uh, the development plan the proffers we heard tonight, which I will summarize briefly by saying is, is that the project will be limited to townhouses, uh, that there will be a double width buffer along the western boundary of the property as it adjoins the uh, shopping center to the west, uh, that there will be a 50-foot uh, building setback on the southern boundary of the property as it was, as it was shown to us on the map today, and that uh, the fourth one would be no more than 50% of the units will have uh, uh, more than a, a single car garage um, door opening. Um, and then uh, I will also note that there is a correction that the maximum number of units on the site will be 79 and not 80. Properly moved. We have a second. 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 Uh, seconded by Commissioner Freeman. Thank you, Commissioner Miller, for the motion. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Commissioner Ghosh? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Satterfield? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Chair Busby? No. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? No. Commissioner Van? No. Commissioner Gibbs? No. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Motion carries eight to five. Great, thank you very much. We will move to our final public hearing. This is a zoning map change this evening. This is case Z17000016. And we will have the start with the staff report. He's good for a second. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, this item is for Copley Farm 2, and this is a zoning mat change request. Uh, the applicant is Robert Schunk. This is for property located within the city's jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Schunk is requesting to change the zoning designation of the property from residential rural to plan development residential 3.997. Uh, this is a 30.9 acre site, which would permit a potential maximum of 123 units. Um, aerial map highlighting the property in front of you. As you see, it's highlighted in red. Um, this site is located uh, just to the north of Freeman Road. I mean, it's also located adjacent to the high school. Um, the property um, is actually, there's actually two pieces. There's a buy right component, which the applicant has received approval for a subdivision along the street frontage closer to Freeman Road. Um, this portion here to the rear, which is highlighted, the applicant is requesting the PDR for that portion. Um, again, the existing conditions, um, noting the site, um, we'll note, you can see area B, uh, maybe a little hard to see on this, um, excuse me. On this screen here, uh, cursor, yeah, I'll circle the B there. Um, please note that is not included in this request, um, but that area is uh, noted as a potential future right of way for the nor Northern Durham Parkway. Uh, the future land use map for this area, um, the subject site is designated as low density residential, which permits four units an acre or less. Um, that is the predominant future land use in this area. Um, there is some very low density residential located north um, across Chunky Pipe Creek. Um, but for the most part, this area is in the low density category. Uh, context map um, in regards to zoning as well. 
Um, it's a, primarily a mix of RS-10, RS-20, and RR zoning in this area um, with a PDR to the north of the subject site. The applicant's request would result in a PDR designation that is contiguous to an adjacent PDR. Uh, district, um, as I noted, the applicant is requesting a maximum of 123 units as part of this request um, with a maximum building height of 35 feet. Uh, no specific unit type has been committed to on this request. It's, um, the proposed conditions, um, as I noted, the applicant is requesting a designation of PDR 3.997. Um, on this excerpt from the de development plan, you can see the adjoining subdivision to the south that this request would tie into. Um, and also on the sheet, you can see there is the, to the north of the Chunky Pipe Creek uh, bounds um, this property to the north, and that future north, northern Durham Parkway is located off-site to the west. Um, comprehensive plan policies reviewed as part of the zoning map change request. There were three key policies, uh, the future land use map, contiguous development, and infrastructure capacity. Staff found that the request did meet those three policies, as well as other relevant policies and ordinances. And staff um, so generally determines that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have at this time regarding this request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. At this point, we will open the public hearing. We have one speaker signed up to speak for, Mr. Robert Schunk. You have 10 minutes if you'd like. Good evening. Let me just uh, switch this around. Good evening, uh, Chairman Busby and fellow uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Robert Schunk. I reside at 2627 University Drive. <coughs> Rockwood Community of Durham. Uh, as Mr. Jacob uh, mentioned, uh, this uh, PDR zoning request is part of a larger community that has uh, we started working on a couple years ago. Um, the zoning acres of what we're proposing is 31 acres. The original development plan request uh, was for 100 acres. So while the density of uh, what we're requesting is just under four units an acre. The aggregate density of all the development will be two and a half units per acre. Um, as I mentioned, we started this project in about 2015. In the spring of 2016, uh, we came before, um, we became, I believe we came before you and council to request an annexation. Uh, we also had to rezone a little sliver of land on the southern property. Uh, we since submitted a conservation subdivision for 143 single family units. Uh, right now, that uh, majority of those uh, that property is under construction. Um, roads and infrastructure going in and homes are slated to, be, to go under construction around the first of the year. During the evolution of the design process, uh, Lennar came to us and uh, spoke to us about wanting to um, maybe build some townhomes on this, on this property. Conservation subdivisions do not allow for townhomes to be constructed. Um, fortunately, the, the, the depth of the unit of the single family units worked well with the depth of the townhome units. So we were able to uh, not have to modify the road layouts and we um, proposed to do the, you know, the townhomes. So the zoning request for here is to provide the townhomes um, uh, within this overall community. As part of this community, we've done, uh, we've also had to extend, uh, again, this is part of the conservation subdivision, extend uh, 4,000 feet of sewer um, down through here uh, to take off line of the city of Durham pump station. Um, as I reiterated, you know, again, the zoning is uh, 43.9, overall density is 2.5. The zoning consists of single family homes as well, townhomes and uh, a couple semi-attached units. Um, in this layout, the uh, townhomes you can, uh, are going to be uh, located uh, central to the development in this area here. So there's good buffering along the eastern side to the existing RS-20 and RR homes to the north, thanks uh, to the Chunky Pipe Creek, and then of course you've got the high school over here, and then uh, Freeman Road to the south. So the, 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 the 
townhomes will, will be insulated to uh, you know, adjacent communities. Um, to the north, uh, one of the PDRs is to the north. That is 3.7 units an acre. Uh, there's a PDR just to the east, uh, a few hundred feet where the sewer goes through. That's all, that has a PDR density of 2.8 units an acre. Again, our uh, so our project does comply with the uh, the flume as indicated in the staff report, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak who has not signed up? If not, we'll close the public comment period and we'll take it to the commissioners. Any commissioners who'd like to ask questions or make comments? I have a question. Commissioner Freeman. I had a question for staff specific to the. Um, I, don't, I just wanted to know where we were with it and how far off, if it were moving forward or not. Well, what did she ask? I'm not sure. So uh, your question is related to um, the, the construction schedule for Northern Durham Parkway or the proximity. Yeah. So it is a um, unfunded. Uh, currently, there is a small portion that is uh, that was previously constructed through Brightleaf at the park, residential development, um, and there's been some other right away reserved or dedicated. Um, the uh, it is in our adopted long range transportation plan to be complete prior to 2045. Currently, um, but we are still trying to obtain state funding for it at this time. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Any further further questions? No. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. <coughs> Let's let Charlie go. <coughs> okay, Commissioner Gibbs. I, I just wanted to add, did, ask Bill, uh, did, did you say the plan for construction as it stands now is 2045? Well, our, uh, our the long range plan that was just adopted by the MPO or is in the process of being adopted is for our 2045 plan and it calls for it, it to be constructed in that plan. Um, but they, right, they, other than that, we don't have any funding identified at this point. Okay, <clears throat> I was just wondering, I got no worries. <laughs> Charlie, you come pick me up and we'll go for a drive on it. <laughs> Commissioner Miller. No worries at all. So as I understand it, and I appreciate the time that, that you spent with me uh, explaining how we were gonna build a, put a PDR in the middle of a conservation subdivision, but in this instant, which would give me some trouble in, uh, as a general concept, but as the way you explained it, uh, essentially what you're doing is changing the zoning to provide for the ability to, to, to build townhomes instead of single family, the single family residential that the uh, conservation subdivision contemplates. That's correct. And that your is if this rezoning goes through, will there be a significant change in density from in the overall in the original conservation subdivision plan? Uh, the conservation subdivision was two units an acre, uh -huh. so we'd be going up to two and a half units an acre uh, for the for the entire hundred acre parcel. Correct. Um, is is there a commitment in this that says that what you build in this PDR will either be single family homes or townhomes? Uh, yes, the first text commitment does speak to being single family homes, townhomes, and semi attached. And the reason semi attached right. is, is there's a couple of units that are and, and that business. commitment would let you build a mix of those three types or all of one of them if you chose to. That is correct. Uh, can I ask you? Um, Something we talked about, um, we're, you were in the room when uh, Mr. Sivers made a commitment with regard to garage doors. Would you make a similar commitment for the townhome portion of this if you build townhomes? Yes, we would be willing to commit that a majority, 51% uh, or more of the townhomes would be single uh, bay garage doors. And I'll work with staff and to confirm that the language is, uh, meets that expectation. Okay, so thank you. Those are my questions. I actually kind of like this project, so I'm going to be voting for it. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Ghosh? Yeah, um, thank you. I just had a couple, well, one question. I think with the conservation subdivision 
Uh, you have some open space requirements. I just want to make sure that with this change, you would be uh, uh, meeting that same, you know, not usurping the uh, original open space requirement that would have been required? That's correct. So as part of the zoning application, we provided staff uh, a site plan that showed that um, the conservation subdivision still uh, meets the requirements of open space. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I want to say, uh, I don't know how many of you were on the council when Becky Winders was here, but this project kind of reminds me of something that she would be really interested in, mm -hmm. a mix of housing types, which ultimately will lead to a mix of incomes living in the same neighborhood, uh, accessing what I understand to be the same amenities, clubhouse or whatever they may, they may be. Um, and I think we need more of that in Durham, and I, I think this is a good project. I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner Kenshin. Uh, I have a question, I think, for Mr. Judd. Uh, this proposed development is very close to Southern High School, and I noticed uh, there's quite a few students up and down that road all the time, and I guess for the developer also. Uh, I want to hear more about what kind of improvements are going to be planned for that uh, area, considering that it's a pretty high traffic area around the school day for Southern High School students. Uh, yes, good evening. So. Um, and to be clear, too, when we, we did provide a uh, traffic impact analysis for this project, uh, we did provide it for the entirety of the development of the community, so it wasn't just focused on the zoning. Right. We looked at the cumulative, cumulative impacts. Um, uh, our traffic engineer did, prov did provide a TIA. Uh, recommendations for improvements were made, to, uh, were provided for um, both intersections to the project, and then a three-lane section would go through the next intersection to the right sort of off screen here. Um, so there's a road called Valmet here. So we'll be doing a three lane widening here and then it tapers. Um, that TIA was submitted to both the NCDOT and the city DOT. Um, and they, those both departments concurred with the recommendations by the traffic engineer. Thank you. And has your question to staff? No, that was, I think that was, he answered it for Mr. Judd. Any other questions or comments, Commissioner Freeman? Just a question based on the comment that Commissioner Amir um, Kinchin made. Is it possible uh, to, to have a proffer of an additional 500 per student for a contribution to Durham Public Schools? Yeah, uh, can you project? repeat the question? I'm sorry. So uh, and it's currently set at 500 per student. Is it possible to have it at 1,000 as opposed to the 500? Um, I would probably like to reserve that. Uh, for uh, when we get to city council. Okay. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions or comments, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll entertain the motion that case Z1700016 move to city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Great. Moved. That was a close one. Moved by Commissioner Hornbuckle, seconded by Commissioner Brine. And I would note that that would include the proffer that was accepted, offered and accepted as well. Uh, we will just, uh, all those in favor, just please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion passes 13 to zero. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, good evening. We have uh, one final piece of new business for this evening, Ms. Smith. Yes, um, if I would, uh, staff would ask that you um, approve the 2018 meeting schedule as presented unless you have some reason to make adjustments. We can always make adjustments throughout the, during the year if we need to. But we did look at this schedule and we, we take into account holidays um, and in other important days during the year that might be of conflict. And th this keeps us on our regular schedule. It does. And I noticed that in February it will not be on Valentine's Day as it was this year. Oh, sure. We've had that before, I know. Yeah. Sorry. Any questions or comments? Do we have to vote on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> can we also take some time to congratulate Ms. Freeman? On yes, that will, that we will do that next. All right, thank you. Uh, do we need a motion to approve these? Yes, okay. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Miller. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. 
Excellent. I will say there was a point in this meeting I thought we'd be here until 2045 when, <laughs> when the highway got built, but we, we started moving things forward. Before we do wrap up, uh, I would like to congratulate and say best of luck to our Commissioner Freeman, uh, who has been elected to City Council. So when we see her next, she will be Councilwoman Freeman. Uh, I. I did ask if she'd be willing to join us. She won't us. come back down here and she, see us. She, she, said, she said she will know how to get here, and she will, she will join us so we can officially honor her with a proclamation at next month's meeting. Uh, I did want to open it up for any of my fellow commissioners to offer any statements, and Commissioner Freeman would certainly welcome you to have the microphone as well. You've been a joy to work with. We appreciate your passion, your commitment to Durham, you're a steadfast raising the right questions, and I certainly hope you'll read our comments <laughs> when we send them forward to City Council. Uh, congratulations, and thank you for your service here on the Planning Commission. Thank you. I want to say that I'll I will probably one of few who will read every comment because those comments are very valuable to keeping the amount of time I have to spend on a case uh, pretty much economy of scales, it shortens that time frame. I, 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 um, I also would like to thank you all for um, being very thoughtful in all these cases. And over time, I've seen how you know, the conversation has shifted, and I appreciate that. It does give, give some credence to the work that um, lies ahead in trying to figure out how affordable housing will shape up in here in Durham. I, I'm excited about what lies next and how we move forward. And I, I want to acknowledge that I, I noted that in that one case around further East Durham, um, there were five votes against it. And I think that that says a lot because I, I, I know that there's some, some missing work or some, some work of, that lies ahead in trying to figure out how to plan for the rural areas that are becoming suburban and quickly moving towards urban. Uh, because they're in city limits. Uh, I, I really hope that you all will, will be mindful of how the rural areas are transitioning over and, and keeping that in mind as we move forward. Great. And I'd open the floor, Commissioner Miller. Uh, uh, yes, I, it's been a, a great joy to work with, uh, I can call her Deidreanna today, in December it'll be Miss Freeman. Uh, but I'm so glad that uh, for your service here, and I look forward to having you being the, the council's uh, uh, zoning sensitive uh, council member uh, in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Ghosh. Yeah, uh, I, I want to extend my congratulations to you on a, on a, a very well-run campaign. Obviously, overcoming the incumbent is no uh, small feat. And so you should be very proud of yourself. I also want to thank you for your time, not only on this commission, but just in Durham generally. Uh, I know you've had a lot of supporters from all over the city, and I think that speaks volumes to you know the, the, the support you have from the city and, and the type of work that you'll be able to do on city council. And I wish you the best of luck in that endeavor. I think your time here on the council has been invaluable, and uh, hopefully um, you'll read our comments. Mr. <laughs> Van. Yeah, yeah, I'll just say too, um, Commissioner Freeman, that uh, I'm sure just as uh, she has um, added um, fuel to the fire here in terms of the work that has to go on, I know I'm very confident she'll do the same on the city council. So we say congratulations to you again. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner. I would just like to say that so that Commissioner Freeman has proof that she was on this body, one of the things that we neglected to do was to take a group picture. So... I would certainly hope that um, before we leave this evening that we can gather as a group so there is a photograph that includes uh, Commissioner Freeman. Look at Ms. Hyman trying to get a photo op with the council. Yeah. Look, we right were supposed the right. to have a group. <clears throat> the meeting's good, I suppose. We'll, we'll have a motion to approve purchase of a selfie stick in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Harris. No selfie bag. Staff has a city-issued iPad. We can take care of the photo. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. Thank you, Mr. To Deidreana, yeah. I'd like to congratulate you. And I remember when you first came here and you came to the uh, Inner Neighborhood Council meetings with the lap baby and then the baby running around on the tables and everything. But your steadfastness and 
your uh, willing to stick it out. I, I really appreciate you for, for being you. Thank you. Don't make me cry. <laughs> and for our viewer or viewers, if I may be optimistic at home, that also means there will be an opening on the Durham Planning Commission. So we hope that you will consider applying. We always are looking for more thoughtful, committed citizens who are willing to be a part of this democratic process. So with that, I will adjourn. Oh. If I could just make a plug that we actually get some female applicants would be great as well. Because I know that we lost uh, quite a few. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. Quite Mr. Miller. Point. Mr. Chairman, before we adjourn, um, I actually have a proposal for a future, as a future agenda item, and this is not something that we've done while I have been on the Planning Commission, uh, is a commission initiated uh, change to the comprehensive plan. I passed out to you, and I will give the staff one too, since it's not an immediate item, a proposal that I have that's in response to a conversation I've had with two developers in the last few months. Uh, and it's something I think is going to occur more frequently. Uh, but the, the developer uh, that I spoke with just yesterday explained that there was a, a case that they're working on with a neighborhood. Uh, the, par the property in question is substantially taken up by a jurisdictional stream. Um, the buildable portion of the property is small. Um, they feel constrained by the... Um, not only the future land use map, but also by the text of the comprehensive plan to put a certain minimum number of units in there because of the designation uh, that it makes everybody uncomfortable and unha unhappy. In other words, cramming, uh, even though the property is a certain size, cramming all the, the minimum number of units that the, the comprehensive plan expects onto the um, the buildable portion of the property is essentially driving the developer and the neighborhood into a collision that isn't necessarily required. Uh, and, I, and, the, and I said, well, why don't you just change the future land use map? And they pointed out that you could change the future land use map, but they still have the table in the comprehensive plan that, would, that, that sets a floor at the lower unit li uh, limit. So I played around with that a little bit over the last couple of days and thought that perhaps a safety valve in the, um, in the comprehensive plan policies that recognized that when we have these properties which have not been developed over time and have been whittled away so that all that's left is unbuildable land, that we need to have some way of building the buildable parts without having to change the text of the, of the comprehensive plan. So. I don't know what the procedure would be for getting this on our agenda to discuss, but I thought the way to start was lay it before you today. Uh, so that's the first thing that I wanted to mention and would be advised by staff on that. And the second thing is, I think it's also appropriate as we note that uh, uh, Commissioner Freeman is going to uh, ascend to the lofty heights of the city council that we also have in the room with us today uh, a candidate for council um, uh, in this last election, Mr. John Rooks, Jr., and if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, uh, at least on my own part, I would like to thank him for his desire to serve the people of the city of Durham. It is appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Commissioner Gibbs. <clears throat> well, it's only appropriate that I get to say a, a word or two about my seatmate here. I, I appreciate the the words that, and the sentiments from everybody, and that goes for me too, Deidreana. Thank you. And I do wish you the best. Uh, I know you'll be one of the hardest working members of the city council. Uh, you have proven that time and time again here. I really have enjoyed our conversations. I have learned a lot. And uh, I told somebody near and dear to you today that that uh, we do need new blood. And I think, uh, I think we're on the right track now to all of us old fogies can leave it to in good hands. Well, don't leave it, you know, we still need it. <laughs> but that's all. Thank you so much, Deidreana. Thank you.
Great, thank you. And one final thing actually was pointed out that we never did officially vote for an excused absence for Commissioner Johnson. So let us do that mm -hmm. before we adjourn for the I evening. I move the excused absence. Second. Great, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. As a unanimous vote. And with that, we will adjourn for photo time. Thank you, everybody.